What is a particle? Like, what makes a particle a particle? What's particle about a particle? <laughs> what makes one particle different from another particle? I've said particle too much. Okay. <laughs> when we talk about particles in quantum physics, we say things like the particle has spin up, or it's negatively charged, it has no mass. What we're describing are properties of particles. And these properties are the way that we distinguish between them. So how we know a photon from an electron or a quark from a gluon. Now, first up, banish from your mind the idea that a particle is a ball. Like, banish it forever. Because it's just the way that we draw it on a blackboard or show it in an animation. The thing is, particles are not small, round, solid objects. We can't represent them accurately in a drawing. Now, if you take this famous image of electron orbitals showing electrons not as points, but as clouds of probabilities, this is more what we're talking about, but it's really hard to represent it easily when we're talking about or drawing and animating it. Now, a while back I made a video that was an introduction to the standard model of physics where I laid out all the particles and their forces. I explained that each fundamental particle has a corresponding quantum field and that particles themselves are excitations of these fields. These fields can interact with one another and sometimes with themselves to create the matter that makes up our universe. Now, quantum fields are everywhere all throughout space and time at every corner of our universe, but they fluctuate. So the energy value of the field is not the same everywhere. Now in quantum mechanics, systems like to be in their lowest energy state. So generally that's where quantum fields are. It's zero point energy. Yes, that's what that means. Now, it's not that the energy is zero, it's just that it's the lowest energy state the field can be in when nothing else is happening. Regions of a quantum field that are then in an excited state, these regions, this, is where what we call particles emerge. And because particles are then localized, quantum mechanics gives us a set of conditions that allows us to describe what particles can exist in this region which corresponds to a fixed set of properties. Now, this doesn't mean that you can personally control a quantum field, but when we interact with it, when we take a physical measurement using equipment, we will find that we get signatures on our detectors that correspond to discrete values, so specific values, a specific quantum of energy, or a specific spin value, a mass value, a charge. What you find out is that each particle has a set of values that describe it, properties that make it that particle. No matter where you measure or how you measure a photon, it will have no mass. An electron will have a negative charge. When you take a measurement and get a set of values, you are defining a quantum state. And that quantum state is what we call a particle. What are the properties that we're talking about? Well, let's talk about three of the most common ones that we hear about, spin, charge, and mass. Starting with spin. Now, angular momentum relates to the rotation of an object. So the Earth has spin angular momentum because of how it rotates on its axis. And you'd be forgiven for imagining an electron doing the same thing and that that being its spin. Unfortunately, it's a bit more complicated than that. Now, in quantum mechanics, there are two types of angular momentum. The first is orbital, which is similar to classical angular momentum, Earth's rotation. The second is spin. The thing is, there is no classical counterpart for spin. So like, we can't say that it's like anything we already know and understand. How we found out about it is that in the 1920s, like 100 years ago, the Stern-Gerlach experiment showed that particles with no orbital angular momentum still possessed two possible values for angular momentum, indicating that there is a second type, spin, and that it is quantized, meaning there are fixed amounts of spin for each particle. They don't speed up or slow down. 
but the direction of the spin can change. And this is where we get spin up and spin down. But please note that this depiction where we use arrows is nowhere near correct to show what spin up or spin down is. We just have no way to draw it. It's just like a rudimentary representation. Basically, the spin value of a particle tells you what type of particle you're dealing with. So bosons have integer spin values and fermions have half integer spin values. And this dictates then how we deal with them, or mainly what type of statistics we use to describe their behavior. Next up, we have charge. Now there are different types of charge, but we tend to think of it purely as positive or negative in terms of like the electric charge, right? But we also have a hypercharge, weak hypercharge and color charge. In general, charge just relates to a flow of some sort. It's a current that generates a continuous symmetry for the system. So in the case of the electric charge, this defines what force a particle will experience when it's in an electromagnetic field. Basically, an electric charge produces an electric field and a moving charge produces a magnetic field. Now, the color charge, which is a fun one, <laughs> relates to quarks and gluons. And it's got nothing to do with actual color. This one is kind of hard, but remember charge is just about a current of something that creates symmetry. Now, there are three color values that a quark could have and three anti-color values that anti-quarks can have. Gluons then can have a mixture of two color charges. And a way to understand the importance of what we call color charge is something called color confinement. Basically, a free particle must have a color charge of zero. So electrons have zero color charge. They're not confined in any way, but quarks are, so they have a color charge. Now, I won't get into a uh, hypercharge or weak hypercharge. It relates to isospin. It gets very mathy, uh, very complicated. But just know that charge is not just about electric charge and positive and negative. Charge is related to symmetries and is defined in different ways for different particles. Now, there are other properties specifically related to conservation when we look at interactions between particles. So things like baryon number, lepton number, weak isospin, flavor, which is like the, the charm and strangeness things that come into it. It's a lot to unpack. But these two, spin and charge, this is what we hear about a lot of the time when we talk about quantum mechanics or quantum entanglement and things like that. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is mass. So particle mass is so small that when we're talking about quantum scales, we're also talking about relativistic effects. So we actually use the mass energy relation in order to describe the mass of a particle, not in kg, but in something called electron volts. Now, one electron volt is the amount of kinetic energy a single electron gets from accelerating through one volt in a vacuum. So one EEV is equal to 1.602 by 10 to the minus 19 joules, which is like 1.7 by 10 to the minus 36 kg. It's so small. Let's think about it this way. An electron is 0.5 MeV, which means it equates to about 8.9 by 10 to the minus 31 kg. Now, for context, a grain of rice weighs about 29 by 10 to the minus 6 kg, meaning you'd fit 3.25 by 10 to the 25 electrons in one grain of rice. That's 32 million, 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 million electrons in one grain of rice. That's particles. Thanks for watching. If you found this helpful, then follow along and check out my page for ways that you can support what I'm doing. Toodles.